so just over three and a half years ago, I was a neuroscience student, sat in a lecture theatre for a university module that hoped to develop more conscientious scientists. I looked at aspects of ethics and philosophy and how these interact with science. And as a liberal student who was dabbling in the, in the women's rights movement, uh, you can imagine how excited I was when feminism in science was on the list of topics that the module would cover. Now, I would love to go back in time and watch my face change from excitement to disappointment as I realised that this part of the module would consist of a single 30-second slide in a four-hour lecture. Because there's not much to talk about when it comes to women in science, is there? Except we are still massively underrepresented in the industry and it's a result of consistent societal pressures and influences that create ba barriers for us starting in childhood and following us our entire lives. On average in Europe, women make up around 17% of STEM employees, STEM being science, technology, engineering, and maths. And in terms of Europe, the UK is on the lowest end of the spectrum, with the number of, STEM in, uh, the number of women in STEM in the UK being around 14%. Women still make up an especially small number of engineers. Again, in terms of Europe, the, the UK is on the lower end of the spectrum. In fact, in Europe, when it comes to women in en engineering, we are the lowest end of the spectrum because women in engineering make up less than 10% of employees. Women make up less than 20% of computer science scientists and physicists and less than 10% of aerospace and mechanics industry employees. Not only are we less likely to be in the industry, we're less likely to be recognised for our work with only 2.9% of Nobel Prizes in history ever being awarded to women. So yeah, there's not really that much to talk about when it comes to women in science. So the, bar the, the influences that cause all of those statistics start where everything starts, childhood. We are products of the society we inhabit. And currently, the society we inhabit divides the population by stereotypes. Now, in terms of gender stereotypes, men are po powerful, dominant, and they're not allowed to be emotional, whereas women are allowed to be emotional. In fact, we're seen as overly emotional. We're judged by our appearance, and we're generally seen as less intelligent. And these stereotypes shape us. They shape us from an incredibly young age. In fact, by the age of three years old, you've already started making decisions on what you think you are and are not capable of based on your gender. And by the time girls reach school age, they've lost confidence in their STEM skills, they're less likely to take STEM subjects, and they're less likely to aspire to STEM careers. In fact, 14 to 15-year-old boys are twice as likely to study, um, aspire to STEM careers than girls are. So we see that girls are lacking confidence in their STEM skills, and they're not really seeing science as a place for them. And if we put it Briefly, there's three things that contribute towards this. Science capital, stereotype threat, and horrendous lack of representation for women in STEM to help form role models for young girls. So what's stereotype threat? Well, basically, it's that girls are being held back by gender stereotypes. Because stereotype threat is a psychological phenomenon observed in oppressed groups. Not just girls, all oppressed groups. And it's where stereotypes regarding those oppressed groups affect their self-efficacy, in other words, their self-belief, and can Im impede their performance on certain tasks. And this happens at an unconscious level. They're not really thinking about it. So an applicable example here is that there's a general stereotype that girls are less intelligent and that we're bad at maths. And this actually impedes our ability to perform in maths and physics. So it's interesting that in the UK, girls outperform boys in every single subject apart from maths and physics. Now, we can manipulate stereotype threat within the classroom, and this will affect girls' grades. So one study found that girls would perform significantly worse on a maths test if they're asked what their gender was before they sat the exam. This is because that question acts as an unconscious cue to remind the girls of the stereotype and therefore impede their ability to perform on the test. Girls will also perform significantly better in maths and physics classroom if the gender split of the class is 50-50. This is because it lessens the intensity of the stereotype. 
because you can imagine if you're one of the handful of girls that we see in physics A-level classrooms across the UK, that it's probably quite an isolating experience and you probably start to get the idea that you're not really meant to be there for some reason. Also, we find that by increasing the representation of women in science, this has a role in affecting stereotype threat. Because by seeing women doing science, it allows girls to imagine themselves doing it, but it also helps to um, combat the negative stereotypes. And increasing representation of women in STEM also has an effect on the other um, factor I mentioned earlier, science capital. Now, science capital is a way of quantifying how likely it is that a child will interact with science on an everyday basis. Because as kids orientate the world, they're not really thinking about science. It depends on a parent-child, adult-child interaction. And we find that gender stereotypes have a way of interacting with this because parents are more than three times as likely to explain a science museum exhibit to their boy child than their girl child. And even if kids manage to orientate all these barriers and they achieve a career in science, women have so much to overcome when they get there. We find that stereotypes follow us our entire lives, and we still assume women to be the primary caregivers. And because of that, women are significantly more likely to take a career break than men. And the reason we take career breaks tend to be associated to family pressures because we're assumed primary caregivers. And these are issues that face women in every industry, not just science. But they throw up particular issues for women in science because the turnover of knowledge in science is incredibly fast. Within five years, 50% of what you know is no longer valid. So it's no surprise that when women in STEM have taken a career break to look after children and assume their primary caregiving role, that they get left behind because their knowledge is no longer applicable to their industry. And we also find that harmful attitudes and stereotypes ultimately affect the everyday lives of working women and affect the way we value women's work in science. You could be the most senior researcher in a lab, but if you walk into that room, someone's going to assume that you are the technician or the receptionist. And that's not just an awkward situation or a really silly mistake, it's a symptom. It's a symptom of a society that doesn't associate women with high achieving careers or roles of authority. So you can see that I've kind of touched on a few problems that face women and girls in science, and you've already got the picture that it's quite a complex issue involving, involving ingrained attitudes in society, it's a multifaceted problem. We're losing girls during their education. We're losing girls, during, women during their careers. And there's no one single simple solution. And I knew that before I walked into that lecture three and a half years ago. But what I also knew was that one of the easiest ways of stopping women from being affected by the barriers that face them is to make them aware of them in the first place. So I stormed home from that lecture theatre, and from my university bedroom, my blog Mindful was born. I wanted a place where I could increase um, awareness of the issues that face women in STEM, and hopefully stop some women, if, even if it was just a few women, from being affected by those barriers. Since then, my blog has grown. I've helped shape public policy surrounding women and girls in, in science. I've written for magazines to raise awareness for the topic. I started a YouTube channel to help create science capital for kids that don't normally get to interact with science. And it also helps with role models because it's presented by a woman. I also gave a lecture at the European Space Agency, talking to the staff there about what they could do to better the representation of women in STEM. And I was mentioned as part of the BBC's 100 Women Project for 2015, which was a list of 100 inspirational women. That lecture triggered me to take that, the movement into my own hands, and it's helped, me make, it's helped made me stem the flow of women out of science. Joachim Farah, thank you very much.